Okay, welcome everyone to um, our CCA credit um, session with Dr. Clayne Jones with Montana State University. And his, um, <laughs> I'm gonna throw this to Gary here in a sec, but I would ask you that um, you put your name and affiliation in the chat. And if you're seeking CCA credits to indicate that as well. Um, and so now I will hand it off to Gary Iverson. Thank you, Jamie. And uh, uh, we appreciate everybody joining us today. Uh, and and uh, the CCA credits is kind of a new thing that we started this summer, um, hopefully to get more uh, certified crop advisors uh, interested in organics. And uh, Dr. Clayne Jones is a uh, uh, our go-to fertility guy at Montana State University. Um, and and uh, I think the majority of you probably have probably seen him before. And uh, uh, so I'll kind of let Clayne go through all of this, but uh, thank you for joining us today, Clayne. All right, thank you for inviting me, Gary. And thank you, Oli, for this great first image. I, is everybody seeing my first slide and hearing me okay? Yep, I see some nodding, great, thank you. So, you know, we have up to an hour and 15 minutes. I have about 40 slides, which generally would take me probably about 50 minutes. Uh, so what I'm encouraging is questions. And I have three slots for questions uh, during the presentation. Jamie will be monitoring the chat box and letting me know if I have any questions, but I really wanna get your questions answered. And that's more important to me than getting to the very last slide. If you do have any questions after the talk, please send me an email or give me a phone call and we can uh, discuss uh, your question. So I have a several objectives today. One to, would be to present nutrient losses from croplands, how nutrients might be leaving your organic farm. Discuss nitrogen supply, which is likely uh, one of your biggest, if not your biggest uh, nutrient deficiencies from both cover crops and manure. Show some options and benefits with adding sulfur, which I think is an increasingly important nutrient in Montana and actually in a lot of the world. Discuss the challenges of phosphorus fertility in organic fields. So as you probably know, uh, there's roughly 14 mineral nutrients which are known to be essential for the growth of most plants. Those are broken into the macronutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and the micronutrients from boron to zinc. The macronutrients aren't any more important uh, than the micronutrients. They're all needed for plant growth. The, the bolded nutrients here are ones that have had an observed nutrient deficiency somewhere in Montana. Uh, the, the others, calcium occasionally has shown up in, in vegetables like tomatoes, but for the most part, we have plenty of calcium, magnesium, molybdenum, and nickel in our soils. How many of these can be grown, meaning can we make, versus need to come from the soil or from an input? It's really only one, nitrogen, right? Rhizobia bacteria can make nitrogen, convert nitrogen gas into plant available nitrogen. One place to start in thinking about what your crops need would be thinking about their removal. So how much nutrients, N, P, K, and S, are removed from, say, 40 bushels of barley grain? Well, about 35 pounds of nitrogen, 14 pounds of phosphorus, 10 pounds of potassium, and three pounds of sulfur. Certainly, you could grow a crop for many years, maybe without having deficiencies. But at some point, if you're not replacing somewhere close to this, you or maybe your children, somebody who buys your land will likely have a deficiency. So you can get a flavor for what the big nutrient users are, like wheat takes up a little more nitrogen than some of these other crops. Canola takes up 
uh, more sulfur. I would guess this number is actually a little bit higher than that. And you have to consider um, wheat straw as well. So when you grow wheat, you of course have wheat grain that's removed, and then you might have wheat straw removed if you bale it. I also show how much nutrient is removed for alfalfa and for grass. And you know, on this whole page, alfalfa really stands out. So if you are haying your alfalfa, uh, everything on this page, that's the crop that's likely removing the most nutrients. So a big question that you should be asking yourself, and I'm sure you are, is nitrogen limiting yield? And if so, how would you know? So protein levels have been really found to be quite prescriptive or diagnostic at predicting nitrogen limitation. So what I mean by that is that if your winter wheat protein has less than 12.5% protein, it's likely that your yield is also limited by low nitrogen. If your protein levels have less than 13.2% protein for spring wheat, again, likely your yield is being limited by low nitrogen. So this would be something you could do after the fact. If you consistently have protein levels lower than those two, you're probably low on nitrogen. And one thing to always look for if you want to know if you're low on nitrogen is lower yellow leaves. So nitrogen defic deficiency shows up as consistently yellow lower leaves. What are some nitrogen options or some options to get nitrogen into your soil? Certainly manure, manure compost, poultry manure would all be ways that you could get nitrogen into a crop. If we think of a spring wheat crop at 14% protein and say somewhere around 3.3 pounds of nitrogen per bushel, you need about 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre. What that means is you need a lot of manure. 15 tons maybe to get 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, maybe 35 tons per acre if you were applying manure compost and somewhat less if you were applying poultry manure. What about cover crops? How much, and pulse crops, how much nitrogen do they leave behind? Well, if you grow a pulse crop, say lentil for grain, uh, you can back off on that next crop by about 10 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Assume that your next crop is going to get somewhere around 10 units of nitrogen. Because pulse crops do such a good job of getting their nitrogen into the grain, which is then harvested. We found that if you grow pulses for at least three rotations, that's maybe contributing somewhere around 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre. What about if you grow a cover crop? Well, now the numbers get to be somewhat higher. So if you grow a pulse cover crop one to two times, you can likely assume you're going to get about 20 to 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre contributed by that cover crop. And if you grow it maybe three times in rotation, you can assume a fair amount more, maybe somewhere around 30 to 50 uh, units. Um, Clayton, we have some specific nitrogen questions about the wheat um, and, okay. and pulses, actually. So Jeff asks, so pulses lose more nitrogen than it adds? That... Uh, nope. So pulses don't lose more nitrogen than they, than they add. This is about how much nitrogen the pulse crop will contribute to the next crop if you remove the grain. So for example, let's say, um, you grow 20 bushels of peas, you remove those 20 bushels of peas, and with it, you remove quite a bit of nitrogen. This 10 units is about how much available nitrogen is for the next crop. That doesn't mean that's how much nitrogen that pulse crop contributed. It might have contributed 40 or 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre, but that's how much is available because a lot of that nitrogen goes into building organic matter. 
And uh, Doug has a question. Okay. Yeah. Plain, I'm not sure I understand the rotation uh, notation or so maybe could you explain that a little better? The one to two times versus three times. Sure. What Perry Miller and I have been finding is that if you grow a pulse in rotation once, say, let's say in the last four years, that pulse crop next year, if you grow a pulse crop in 2021, ignore the drought, um, in 2022, it probably contributed about 10 pounds of available nitrogen per acre. The next time you grow it, let's say in five years or four years, maybe contributes about 10. Once we get up to about three, we see a fair amount more, maybe 20 pounds of nitrogen per acre, uh, where pulse cover crops contribute more. But it's a good question. Is it, Am I talking about one over 10 years? What I'm talking about is if the previous year was a pulse crop grown for grain, it's probably contributing around 10 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Um, Craig has a question about weed pressure um, brought on during pulse crop, the pulse crop growing season. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the question? Uh, uh, the question is how to, ha how to handle, uh, whenever you grow a, a, at least like lentils are very, not very competitive. So you end up with a lot of weed pressure during that season, even though maybe you get a little bit of nitrogen gain. Does it work? You know, what's the what's the overall add? Yeah, I mean, weeds are, as you guys all know, a, a major problem in both conventional and organic systems, and that's a a trade off that people have to weigh. Peas are going to be a little more competitive uh, than lentils because of their their height. Did that answer your question, though, Craig? Well, it just states the problem. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and I Steph. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I want to just nail this maybe down what Doug already said was, but um, it does appear then from this, and maybe you're going there, so I shouldn't jump ahead. Everybody's calling me all of a sudden. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> it seems like the more frequently, whether used for grain or cover, the more complicated, I would say, or the more often and the more maybe diverse of your rotation, the better gain you get from pulses. Right. The more often they're in rotation, the more gain you get. But I saw Doug shaking his head like, Clayne, I don't know what I don't know what you were talking about. So I didn't do a good job. Doug, do you want to um, ask it a, a different way? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand, like, are you saying if you have three pulses in your rotation, you can double the credit? If, if you, if over the last 10 years, to be somewhat arbitrary, but over the last 10 years, if you had three pulses grown for grain on a particular field, uh, we think from our research that that contributes about 20 pounds of end per acre, that last pulse crop. And it's because of that accumulation of nitrogen from okay. those two previous ones. I just like the first thing that occurred to me is, well, there's a recipe for disease disaster. If, we're, if, if the recommendation for fertility is to pack the pulses in, uh, yet, you know, Mary and our friends in the diagnostic world are telling us never less than two years between and ideally three to five. And so it kind of conflicting. Uh, yeah, and it's not a recommendation. It's just what we're finding <laughs> if if you have three pulses for yeah. grain. So gotcha. Yeah, I guess that, that was my confusion. Is okay. Thanks, Doug. All right. Anything else, Jamie? I think we're caught up. All right. So Legumes likely are going to be, I think, your best nitrogen source on Montana organic farms. There's, for those who have livestock, manure might be uh, the better choice. But again, looking at the volumes of manure that you you would need, especially on say a you know four thousand acre farm, it gets to be more probably manure uh, than you have, and that's why I say legumes are are likely going to be the way to go for a lot of you. So when does nitrogen get released from plant residue? Well, research shows that most of that release 
is for the first year in those seven to 10 weeks when the conditions are suitable for decomposition. So that's going to depend on the nitrogen content. It's going to depend. Just a sec. There you go, Clayne. Sorry about that. Okay. It's still saying I'm muted, but I'm not. Nope, you're not muted. Okay. Um, the decomposition rate is going to depend on the freshness, the structure, how much lignin is in that particular legume. After that first kind of short period of a release, that might be the year that, say, a, a pulse cover crop has grown, a legume cover crop has grown. Uh, what we see is that the release is relatively steady after that period with just a slow uh, drop off. One study we found showed that about 15% of pea cover nitrogen was used by spring wheat the following year. Again, that might seem low, but a lot of that nitrogen likely went into building organic matter, which isn't a bad thing. It's going to come out eventually. Another study found that 55% of pea cover nitrogen was used by crops over the three following years. So that nitrogen eventually, most of it does come out, a little bit of it stays behind in organic matter. So looking at a graph of plant available nitrogen in pounds per ton of residue on the y-axis. On the x-axis is the total nitrogen as a percent of dry matter. So as you can picture, as percent nitrogen goes up from 1% to 2% to 3%, the plant available nitrogen also is going to go up. And in fact, if you have a really low total nitrogen, this might be for say, you know, wheat that's allowed to get fairly uh, mature, it's gonna have a really high carbon to nitrogen ratio and almost no available nitrogen is gonna come out. Whereas if you have say a pea crop, which has very high total nitrogen, quite a bit of plant available nitrogen can come out. So let's look at some specifics there. Oh, and sorry, the blue dots are four weeks after termination. The yellowish brownish line here is 10 weeks after termination. So an immature legume crop is probably going to have somewhere around 3% total nitrogen, release a fair amount of plant available nitrogen per ton of residue. Cereals that are uh, you know, fairly far, far along, somewhere around stain, stem elongation, brassicas that are at flower might be somewhere around 2% nitrogen. Notice there you're not going to get nearly the nitrogen release as you would from an immature legume. And then again, cereals post heading have very little nitrogen and therefore almost no plant available nitrogen. Bottom line is the earlier you cut or the earlier you terminate a, a cover crop, the more nitrogen that will likely get released. But you have the trade off that the later you cut it, the more biomass you've built. This is a somewhat busy looking uh, graph until uh, you spend a little time with it. What it's showing is the nitrogen released in pounds per acre at a site in Alberta over an extended period of time, up to about 160 weeks, so three years, for four different crops. Two of those crops were cut for grain. So pea cut for grain shows you know, relatively little nitrogen released in that first year, but that nitrogen continues to come out for an extended period of time. Faba bean, because it's a really good end fixer and a, a really robust crop, especially it seems uh, north of our border uh, where they get you know, more rain, a little cooler temperatures, can release quite a bit of nitrogen, up to about 120 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre. And that's just from the residue. Faba that's terminated for cover, meaning it's tilled, shows a faster release of nitrogen, but then a continued release for several years. Vetch that's terminated as cover, tilled into the ground, has a really fast release, and then a flattening 
of that release over time. Take home message is if you take a crop all the way to grain, you're going to have a slower release and likely a longer period where that nitrogen slowly bleeds off. Covers that are terminated and not cut for grain have a much faster release, but then more of a plateau over time. Any questions so far? Yeah, we have one from Craig about the gains in nitrogen at intercropping. Yeah, I, I wish I had more data on that. Perry's done some very, Perry Miller, my colleague here in Bozeman, has done um, some small studies on that. I know they've done more in Canada. I've seen them primarily in conventional systems, um, but I unfortunately have not seen intercropping data on organic farms. And so that's, I think, a, a big area of needed research. My gut feel though, you know, one of the classic um, intercropping strategies, at least used in Canada, would be something like chickpea and uh, flax, two seeds that are very different in size. The goal in Canada is actually to reduce ascochyta blight on the chickpea by using up a little bit of um, the moisture. My gut feel is the chickpea will use the nitrogen that's available. The flax will use the nitrogen that's available. The flax won't get really much of the nitrogen from the chickpea because the chickpea's fixing for itself. Um, that's just kind of a qualitative answer. Okay, uh, Doug has a comment um, that they don't consider manure or compost to be a significant contribution to their nitrogen needs. Um, there for the pea, we need to grow the nitrogen with legumes. Yep, I agree that manure is really a much better source of, of phosphorus than the nitrogen. I agree with you, Doug. And then Joseph asks, is there any difference between nitrogen release from terminated and incorporation or no incorporation into the soil? Uh, there, there is. And so um, Perry Miller and Matt Burgess did a three-year study here in a 14-inch rainfall zone out um, about halfway between here and Three Forks. And what they found was that by tilling, there was uh, quite a bit more nitrogen released, and that showed up in largely higher protein um, than in, say, a no-till system where the residue was left on the surface. Presumably, that's because decomposition can uh, happen a lot faster, so it's certainly an advantage in tilled uh, organic systems over residue left on the surface. Thanks, Joseph. Ken. Can you speculate, Klein, if, if our termination method is, is a noble blade that leaves most of the surface residue on the surface rather than incorporating, uh, how would that impact nitrogen release from a pea or a vetch? Right, I think it would be you know somewhat intermediate. When you look at that residue left after a noble blade that's sitting, say, right at the surface, but not buried, a lot of times it's fairly you know, it, it's dry, it's harder for microbes to get to it. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because the next time you till or seed and get that incorporated, there's going to be a slower release, but I don't think that nitrogen's really going anywhere. I think most of it's Good. sticking around on your field. Good. That actually makes sense for containing the moisture too for the next year. Mm -hmm. True, yep. Uh, I was I was considering try, trying to use legumes to uh, as with intercropping so that it one keeps helps with the weed pressure and provides a little nitrogen. <clears throat> so weed pressure is probably a bigger issue than nitrogen in many cases. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, Plain, would yeah. you mind uh, if you I don't know what comment you would have. Um, on building soil organic matter with respect to when you have a legume, I know you focused on soil fertility here as, you know, legumes contributing that N, but we don't have a lot of biomass on the legume. So could you maybe talk a little on, you know, building soil organic matter in 
where legumes are, in, are, are used in, as part of the rotation. Yeah, so you, you, are you talking legumes either grown for grain, like, yes, or cover crop. like, like timeless or as a yes. cover crop? Yes, sir. Yep. Um, so, so both have good potential to build organic matter. The, um, because a lot of residue, you know, when you compare a cover crop, say, that's grown to bloom, say, first bloom stage, yeah. with a uh, lentil that's grown all the way to grain, um, a lot of times the residue left behind is like that much different. Partly the one grown for grain has grown longer, but you're removing the seed. And so both have the potential to grow organic matter. I think there's a lot of focus out there on carbon to nitrogen ratios. So the kind of the textbook dogma would be that um, that higher C to N left behind after a grain crop might stick around a little bit longer. And that's what we saw from that nitrogen release curves. Whereas the lower C to N cover crop is probably going to be break down faster and be used a little more for uh, the next crop. But yeah. The, you know, there's great data from um, Rick Engel, my colleague, um, also in southern Canada, that shows a very strong correlation between residue returned and soil organic matter. The more residue you return, the higher your soil organic matter. I think that hopefully makes, uh, you know, sense to you all. So anything you can do to return residue is going to help build organic matter. Hey, Monbeer has a question. Does the quick release of nitrogen by tilling cover crop beneficial for following crop or does that make nitrogen more susceptible to leaching? You know, probably probably a little of both. It's gonna depend a lot on your, your soil, uh, your climate. This last year, I wasn't really worried much about leaching. And, you know, in our 14, you know, 12 to 15 inch rainfall zone, uh, we know that leaching can happen and, and does happen, but I really feel for the most part, most of our nitrogen stays in the soil. So um, releasing it and having it available to the next crop is, is probably better, especially thinking about, you know, really high protein premiums for say spring wheat, where you want to get that nitrogen into your subsequent crop. Good question though, Mambir. We're now in a four to eight inch zone, it seems. It does seem that way. All right, if there's nothing else, I am going to move on. Okay, so a little bit on cover termination timing. Some questions to ask, and this is a fairly long list in deciding when you should time your cover crop termination. One would be, is water and nitrogen more limiting? Doug's in a 40 inch rainfall zone now, um, it's gonna be water. Another question is, do you typically get decomposition in the fall or not? Do you have risk like man bear asked about of overwinter leaching? Do you have some early nitrogen demand for a spring crop or are you planting maybe uh, something later, a warm season crop, maybe even leaving the ground fallow? To increase the amount of nitrogen in your cover crop, you of course want to plant all legumes. You probably want to grow to somewhere on pod stage if nitrogen is more limiting than water. That will grow more nitrogen. But if water is more limiting, uh, then you're going to want to terminate earlier. And I'd say somewhere around, you know, bud to maybe first bloom. If you want to speed up the release, because maybe you're planting um, a crop that takes up the nitrogen early, you're going to want to terminate when the plant tissue is young rather than letting it uh, get closer to maturity to allow more time for nitrogen release. If nitrogen is not needed in the early spring, then you might want to consider playing with when you till, if you can afford to do that for weed control. So for example, if you till shortly before the ground freezes, that's going to slow down uh, the breakdown then compared to say 
tilling to terminate and then tilling well before freezing, which is going to really speed up decomposition. Also, if your nitrogen is not needed till early in the spring and you want to slow down the nitrogen release, you might want to consider a higher carbon to nitrogen cover crop like a grass in the mix, something like oat. And then plan your rotations to catch nitrogen. I think most of you probably do that. Planting, say, a high protein wheat, a spring wheat after a cover crop to not just catch that nitrogen, but your best chance of having high protein wheat is likely after a cover crop. So let's look at some uh, actual data from Montana. This was collected by my colleague, uh, Perry Miller. Um, Jeff, you have a question? I do. And meh, we can, we can hold it, keep going for a while, but okay. it's, it's regarding summer fallow and termination deadlines and uh, some issues with crop insurance, but maybe it's maybe either at the end or somebody. I just thought it was appropriate because you're giving all these options for termination, but RMA and crop insurance has a very specific timing and that could screw people up. Sure. Yep. Good points. Uh, so this is data collected by Perry Miller and his graduate student, Erica Izzard, up in uh, Big Sandy on Bob's place. What we're tracking here is above ground pounds of nitrogen per acre uh, that's taken up um, by the next wheat crop when spring pea was grown as the previous cover crop versus winter pea. Notice that the above ground nitrogen per acre between terminating that spring pea at first bloom versus first pod, a little surprisingly, was not different. That might be, even though we know by waiting till pod, we probably grew more nitrogen, there was less time for that nitrogen to become available. Whereas when we terminated at first bloom for winter pea versus at pod, uh, we the next crop took up a fair amount more nitrogen, about 15 or 20 pounds more nitrogen per acre, probably again, because by waiting till pod for winter pea, that's still a lot more time for decomposition to occur. And we know winter pea is a really excellent nitrogen fixer. Looking at the next year's, uh, the winter wheat that was grown, the protein level in that winter wheat, the by growing spring pea, to pod, we actually saw somewhat higher winter wheat protein, even though we didn't see any more above ground um, total nitrogen, suggesting yield was hurt, probably due to water uptake. When we grew winter pea as the cover crop, notice how much higher the protein level was in that winter wheat, over one point higher. So that could be the difference between finding a buyer and not, or uh, maybe getting discounted for a uh, low low wheat. And I realize spring wheat is going to be um, more common in organic systems than, uh, than winter wheat for the most part. What about uh, winter wheat grain yield after a range of different covers? So here we grew mustard, spring pea, and winter pea to bloom. We also grew those same crops, mustard, spring pea, and winter pea to pod, and then we used fallow essentially as a control. Winter wheat grain yield after the winter pea was significantly higher, almost seven or eight bushels per acre higher than when winter wheat was grown after spring pea or mustard. And again, after pod, the winter wheat grain yield was quite a bit higher after winter pea than spring pea or mustard. And for the most part, yields were substantially higher, three to four, maybe bushels per acre higher by terminating early because of the water conservation of early termination. That was in 2006. In 2007, we saw generally uh, similar trends, but for the most part in 2007, the yields outcompeted yields in 2006 and actually outcompeted fallow, which we don't see uh, very often just because fallow stores uh, more water. 
thought question for you who have been farming since 2006, 2007, why was yield after green manure mostly less than after fallow in 2006, but the yield was higher after green manures in 2007. And instead of waiting for an answer, the, the answers you could probably guess came down to precipitation. In Big Sandy that year, 2007 was a moister year than 2006. So it didn't really hurt to grow cover crops from a moisture perspective, whereas it did in 2006. So what are some practices to increase the amount of nitrogen fixed? Certainly growing a perennial versus an annual, but you're gonna use more water. Winter annuals, as I just showed, generally winter annuals are going to fix more nitrogen. There's challenges with establishment and overwintering in Montana in many, many places. Uh, our winter lentil and winter pea do not survive. Growing those legumes or those covers longer, you risk higher water use, but maybe you get a little more nitrogen fixed we've found that in dry years, we actually, peas do not fix any more nitrogen after bloom, whereas they do in wet years. And make sure you have adequate other nutrients. So the nitrogen fixation process really requires quite a bit of other nutrients. So phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, iron are all needed for adequate nitrogen fixation. Inoculation, of course, and there are, um, you know, certified organic sources out there. This is a photo that I, I took back in 2007 of winter pea in a couple of Perry Miller's crop rotation studies where I show organic uh, winter pea that was not fertilized versus right next door winter pea that was fertilized with phosphorus potassium, and sulfur. A couple differences here. The, the crop was quite a bit greener when it was fertilized and might be hard to see depending on your screen, but there's quite a few more nodules. The other difference though is, is here, the roots look actually a little bit fuller. So I think that organic crop was trying to find uh, nutrients and actually had a fairly um, healthy root system, but it does show that you can get more nodulation with adequate phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur. When we did some tissue testing, this really came down to phosphorus and sulfur, not potassium. Are you ready for a couple of questions, McLean? Sure. Um, Oli asks, should we fertilize a pea plow down crop with sulfur to increase nitrogen production of the pea? Yeah, and I do have a, a figure from, or a photo from 2020, uh, last year here, uh, west of Bozeman, showing a dramatic effect on greenness and, and fixation of um, pea and lentil when sulfur was applied, a small amount of sulfur. So I think it depends on your, your fields. You know, there's fields in Montana that are loaded with sulfate, um, especially in the triangle. Central Montana has pockets of really low sulfur as does Southwest, um, any place where the soils are rocky and there's a little more precipitation. So I think I can't answer for, you know, generally across Montana, I would do some, some checks where you apply a little bit of gypsum, organic gypsum, um, and see if your crop uh, greens up and produces more biomass. And then Doug has two questions. One, do you have data on sweet clover nitrogen production release? No, Perry did use sweet clover in uh, one of his long uh, term studies. We did see some pretty good uh, biomass nitrogen. I, I don't have it in, in this talk. I'd, ha I'd have to dig a little bit for that, uh, Doug. Um, I don't think I've seen anything in the published literature, but I know sweet clover. Uh, has been used quite a bit in Montana uh, for uh, cover crop. And then what about seeding dates for green manures? 
Uh, we find that seeding as early as possible allows us to terminate earlier uh, with less water use. Yeah, that's a good question. And in our like cover crop mixture study, which we, we started about 10 years ago and stopped in 2019, the first year we seeded as early as we could in, in early April, terminated early in June. Talking with a number of producers, they were like, you know, early April is when I'm trying to get my crops that I'm going to make money on uh, into yeah. the ground. And so we pushed till till May. I yeah. think if you can, if you have the time and the equipment, um, probably earlier, the better for more time for decomposition and water savings, if you can. One of the real ahas for us is that we got to think more long term. And if, if you're actually trying to grow your rotation to its maximum benefit, we go out there as soon as we can get across the field and no till our green manure is in while we're tilling and waiting for weed control on the on the harvested crops. And it's been a huge advantage uh, into you know getting those in a week or two earlier. Um, you know, in terms of moisture management and, and nitrogen production. Yeah. So. Yeah, makes sense to me. Okay, does that hit them all? All right. Um, Doug pointed out in the chat that, you know, we can't grow winter crops up that far, that far north. This does show some winter pea roots, uh, again, in the same study, organic that wasn't fertilized versus fertilized with P, K, and S. Um, now that we've zoomed in, you can see that there were some nodules in this organic system. They just were, um, you know, substantially smaller. And we think that's why we saw some early season uh, chlorosis was likely due to low nitrogen fixation, but it might have been uh, just low sulfur. It was it was one of those two. So thinking about termination timing, I'm using uh, some work done by my colleague Dan Sullivan at Oregon State in the Willamette Valley, where they plant uh, sometime in March, and then they measure the plant available nitrogen from the cover crop for 100% legume, 75% legume with the rest being a grass, 25% legume, the rest being a grass, and then a, a cereal. Notice that by terminating a legume somewhat early, you get really high amounts of plant available nitrogen from that cover crop. In this case, uh, they got about 90 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre when it was 100% legume. 75% legume, they still got a fair amount, around 60 units of nitrogen. But when they dropped to 25% legume, notice that they got almost no plant available nitrogen. And if they terminated late, sometime after bud, they, they basically got you know, a net of zero. And then a cereal actually showed, for the most part, negative plant available nitrogen. So that all that carbon that a cereal produces without much nitrogen, microbes end up breaking down that carbon and stealing nitrogen away from the crop. So early termination and having somewhere probably more than about 40 or 50% legume is probably the way to go. Also getting back kind of to Doug's question, the frequency of legumes needed to supply Nitrogen is important, but needing to keep a disease, of course, in mind. So this is a study four miles west of Bozeman, 16 inch rainfall zone, total one foot soil nitrogen. So this isn't what's available. This is just total in the organic matter, quite a bit up in the thousands. You probably all have thousands of pounds of nitrogen per acre in your organic matter. We measured the total nitrogen in different rotations in a couple of Perry Miller study. One where a legume cover crop was grown one in four years, twice, so this was an eight-year study, for a, a no-till diverse, low nitrogen input system, a continuous wheat system that would have had high nitrogen amounts, 
and then an organic system. Notice there was no difference in total nitrogen among those three systems, even though these would have received quite a bit more nitrogen fertilizer. One thing to keep in mind, though, is even though the total nitrogen was the same, the conventional systems had the advantage of being able to take you know, fertilizer nitrogen and bump yields in protein. The organic system would have had to get all of its nitrogen from decomposing organic matter. So I really think organic nitrogen has to be higher um, to actually get probably decent yields and protein premiums. In a neighbor, neighboring study where the rotation was a two-year study, two-year studies of fallow wheat, continuous wheat, a spring pea winter wheat system, all um, either conventionally tilled or no-tilled, organic actually numerically ended up with a fair amount higher amounts of nitrogen. But again, this took growing a cover crop one in two years. So those would be years where you wouldn't be you know, growing a crop for production. So my point here is if you really wanna build total nitrogen, you're probably gonna to have to increase your cover crop uh, frequency with a focus on, on legumes. In work done by Chengxi Chen um, in central Montana and in Stanford, this is all organic systems. He used a winter pea that was grazed, a winter lentil that was tilled, a winter pea that was grown for grain, and an oat crop. He tracked the following year's winter wheat grain yield in bushels per acre, and he also tracked percent protein. Notice that the, the highest yielding and the highest protein wheat came by growing a winter pea and grazing it. The next highest was growing a winter lentil um, and tilling that as a cover crop. Winter, or winter wheat protein really wasn't hurt by growing crops for grain, but notice how much the yield was hurt, likely because these crops used a fair amount more water. Especially for those of you who are relatively new to organic farming, one thing that I urge is patience because it takes time for your cover crops to build up nitrogen and therefore start helping yield and protein. It doesn't happen generally after one rotation. This is work done by Brett Allen in Culbertson, Montana from 1992 to 2002, where he compared a tilled fallow system that had 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre added with a lentil green manure system with no added nitrogen. Notice in the first few years of this study, wheat yield was dramatically lower by growing a lentil green manure than by just tilling and adding 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Probably a lot of that nitrogen ended up building organic matter and not being released to the crop. Plus there would have been the water uptake of that lentil green manure. But notice by about five or six years into the study, the two curves become fairly identical. So the lentil green manure has built up some organic matter, probably is helping that soil hold more water and releasing more nitrogen. And now it's competing with a tilled fallow system that actually has 30 units of nitrogen added. In that same study where Brett tracked wheat grain protein in percent, what he found again was that those first few years, winter wheat grain protein was substantially less after lentil green manure than after tilled fallow, even with that additional 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre. But it looks like by about 1995, just four years into the study, uh, the two curves become a lot more similar. So it looks like pulse legumes in rotations, especially in this case, a lentil green manure can benefit protein uh, a little before it's going to benefit yields. And pretty impressive when you consider that this tilled fallow system is not, you know, really using much water and it has another 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre added. 
that that lentil green manure system is really competing quite favorably. Here's getting at your, maybe your question on interseeding. Here I show um, yield and bushels per acre. So this was in, you can probably guess a fairly uh, a dry year where wheat was grown, pea was grown, wheat was grown in combination with pea, lentil, straight lentil was grown, and then wheat was grown in combination uh, with lentil. Not the traditional like interseeding that's being done, say, in Canada, but an interseeding approach nonetheless. And what Chengxi found was that, you know, in, in all cases, these intercropped systems seem to compete quite well, especially uh, with wheat and even with, you know, the monocrop of, say, pea, where there was simply more production. Any questions? Zach, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Sure. Yeah, Clayton, you talked about increasing the frequency of uh, legging green manures to every other year to, to really build that organic nitrogen pool. Um, and I was wondering if, if you're aware of any research of what legging combinations would be good to minimize that disease risk you know rather than a p every other year would p one year cash crop the next year and then uh clover or fava is there any information about which which share less disease yeah you know not data that i have but you know trust i mean trusting what rma has found you know pea and lentil you don't want to have probably in the same two or three year period um changing not just species but getting out of you know pulses chickpeas seem to have different diseases than pea and lentil so so definitely mixing it up our rotations were quite simple and a lot of times we researchers you know like simple but it's not you know real world and so yeah mixing up your your type of rotation would be, your type of legume would be ideal. Sweet clover is a safe bet to rotate with the annual pulses. Yeah. And then Jeff has a question about more recent studies um, on organics. Yeah, there's, you know, there's continued to be some work on organics uh, in Montana. Um, I am possibly, you know, the most efficient person where I did a lot of work uh, with Perry, Bob Quinn, um, back in that, that time frame, Jeff, and then uh, got busy with other projects like our mixed cover crop work, nitrate leaching, um, urea volatilization, and acidification. So I haven't done um, that much work, and yeah, it's time to get back into it for sure. Yeah, it's just, it was just a comment. I'm noticing everything 2008, 2010, yeah. <laughs> many, many of these I've heard before, but that's not bad. <laughs> Just that, right. that I kept thinking, well, is there any newer stuff? Is there newer stuff coming out of Canada that people are paying attention to that could be relevant? Possibly. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've shown some, some yeah, work from about some of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. Just an FYI. <laughs> yeah. Anything else there I missed, Jamie? You're cut up. All right, sounds good. Moving on to manure. So as you probably know, uh, one issue with manure is it's highly variable, just even within uh, one species, within one pile of manure. And so for testing it, you really need to take samples from different areas of the pile or make sure that it's it's well mixed. As Doug pointed out, you know, most manure sources are quite low in nitrogen and a lot of that nitrogen that's there isn't available, but it's tied up in fairly recalcitrant on uh, available forms. A lot of the phosphorus somewhat surprisingly is available and I found this in, in multiple 
studies where phosphorus in the organic form is, is much more available than, say, conventional phosphorus fertilizer, which tends to get absorbed or, or precipitate fairly quickly. So that's good news for using manure as a phosphorus source. This is a table that shows NP and uh, K amounts for different types of manure, beef, dairy solids, dairy slurry, swine, and poultry with nitrogen amounts, phosphorus amounts, and potassium amounts generally increasing as we move from beef and dairy to swine and poultry. One nice thing about manure is it contains micronutrients, something that's often you know, not uh, applied in many, say, conventional systems and something that may be becoming more deficient in both conventional and organic systems. Another nice thing is all manure contains quite a bit of calcium magnesium, which will buffer uh, your, your pH. And as you probably have heard in many conventional systems, in Montana, uh, there's starting to be quite big problems with acidification. Phosphorus can uh, run off. It's one big uh, potential loss of manure, especially if it's not incorporated. Nitrogen can leach, and nitrogen can also volatilize. A fair amount of the nitrogen in manure is in the ammonia form and that can volatilize and result in some fairly big losses. So you probably want to be incorporating your manure. When you're adding like say very high amounts of manure, you know, up in that 10 ton per acre range, you might have to worry about uh, increasing phosphorus and potassium to, you know, fairly high levels. So uh, for those of you that are applying manure on a fairly frequent basis at high amounts, uh, you should probably be testing your soil and make sure you don't have excess amounts of P or K. There's been a couple lo very long-term studies using organic uh, manure compost, some work done in Utah, and now that work has been extend ex extended into Montana and Wyoming. Uh, this is a study in Utah looking at compost that was applied in 1995 at a, at a pretty high rate, 22 tons per acre of cattle manure compost, and then wheat grain yields were tracked in bushels per acre. Notice that this shows some very high yield increases with compost uh, than without and this was due to a couple different reasons. One was kind of a soil health, organic matter hold more water effect. And the second was due to a uh, nutrient benefit. Notice that these benefits lasted for about 12 or 15 years. Uh, there wasn't high protein at this site. The yield benefit was higher at the one site that had lower precipitation and lower soil nutrients, again, suggesting this was a water and a nutrient effect. And a big question is, would this be economical? Because these are fairly high rates and to make compost isn't uh, cheap at all. I did some work back in uh, 2009 on one of uh, Perry Miller's crop rotation cycles that was an organic treatment where I got organic beef manure here from the valley, applied nine tons per acre, and then tracked winter wheat grain yield both with manure and without manure, and found a, a, a nice substantial about 14 bushel per acre increase in the manure applied plot. There was no effect on grain protein or weeds, and there was no effect the subsequent year. So it seems this was a fairly short-term benefit, likely because of increased nitrogen and likely increased phosphorus that simply did not stick around uh, for long enough for the lentil crop to benefit. One thing, of course, you're going to have to Think about for those of you who have hillier 
you know, farms would be leaving that manure on your field and not allowing it to run off. And again, incorporating it, not applying it on snow or frozen ground, uh, some sort of some sort of contour tillage or diversion or cover crop to capture that manure before it runs off. There might be vegetated buffer strips or some crop residue that might uh, reduce erosion and certainly not on steep slopes. One thing to think about if you're getting consistently low proteins and it, and it doesn't really maybe agree with your thinking about how much nitrogen is available is you might be ending up with a, a sulfur deficiency. This is a photo of sulfur deficient peas, which I'm seeing a, a fair amount of sulfur deficiency in legume crops in Montana. So a little bit on sulfur fertility. I've found and we see kind of in, in various areas that sulfur fertility can be lower in cold and dry soils, coarse soils, because it can leach and also hilltops and on um, steep slopes. Gypsum is a, is a source of sulfur and there are organic sources of gypsum that might not be all that much more expensive than conventional sources, but I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong there. Elemental sulfur, I believe there are organic elemental sulfur sources that will cost somewhat less per pound of sulfur than gypsum, but it takes longer to break down and it requires microbial activity to get that process really rolling. There's uh, potassium sulfate sources, which would be uh, much more available than say elemental sulfur, but I don't know how many of these are actually organically certified. And then manure has some uh, sulfur, but the amount of sulfur can be highly variable again within a pile. This is the work that I was referring to on the benefits of sulfur on nitrogen fixation. And this was work done at the post farm west of Bozeman, where we had some treatments with five pounds of sulfur per acre and some with none. And as you can hopefully see, the none were quite chlorotic. And this resulted in a lot more nitrogen fixation, which is what I have plotted here, and fixed in, in pounds per acre for our five treatments with no sulfur and fixation average somewhere around 80, 85 pounds of nitrogen per acre. Uh, but with that relatively small amount of sulfur, five pounds per acre, the amount of N fixed was about 30 pounds of nitrogen uh, more per acre. And so it was substantial. And I would be interested in whether we might see uh, any responses like this on organic lentils in Montana. So yeah, about 33 pounds of nitrogen per acre, more in fixation with sulfur. Any questions? Oli? Uh, Clem, do you have any experience with the foliar sulfur out to the plants instead of the fertilizing it out? I don't. In this, you know, in this study, we actually had one system that um, had micronutrients and those micronutrients added about another pound of sulfur per acre. Um, but we haven't done a, a study on on foliar. Do you have do you have access to a, an organic foliar source of sulfur? Don't know yet. Don't know yet. OK, uh, but I, I, uh, I can see the issue out there as, as, a, as a, and that's why I asked the question earlier regarding the plow down. So that's something I need to, to work on to figure out. Yeah, I think if you know if you can find gypsum relatively cheap, the nice thing there is that the sulfur would be available earlier in the year um, than waiting for a foliar application. True. Thanks. Craig. Yeah, I had a question about the sulfur. Um, I do. I'm all organic as well, but I uh, 
I added elemental salt for this last spring, but I added a little bit more than I probably needed just because it was a good price on some land. How mm -hmm. long will that stay in the uh, ground and spread out over the years? Yeah, so what I've seen is it takes up to about three years to fully oxidize, meaning convert from sulfur to sulfate, but with probably, you know, maybe half of that getting oxidized, getting made available in that first year, and then a, a slower release after that. So I would say, you know, two, three years, and then that sulfate is susceptible to leaching, just like nitrate is. But if you have dry years, probably it's going to stick around in your root zone for a while. All right, thank you. Anything else besides Doug's cute dog there? I think we're good. Okay. So on to phosphorus. Uh, you know, one concern I have is with organic systems is that for those who are not, say, applying rock phosphate or bone meal or manure, uh, that available phosphorus is likely going down. This is uh, from some work done on, on Perry Miller's crop rotation here again, west of Bozeman, where I tracked over a 12 year period, the change in Olson phosphorus for continuous wheat, a no-till oil seed dominated system, a no-till diverse system, a no-till pulse system and then pe a pesticide free system so this had fertilizer but no pesticides and then an organic system that did not have manure or bone meal or rock phosphate added and what you can see is the olsen phosphorus in the organic system was the only one that fell and it fell uh, by about eight parts per million over that 12 year period. So it's just something to keep in mind in organic systems that your Olson phosphorus might be going down if you're not uh, replacing it. And most of your phosphorus would probably be ending up in your crop, um, probably less actually being lost in the form of erosion. Here's some work from uh, Manitoba where they track both Olson phosphorus, meaning available phosphorus, as well as total phosphorus over uh, extended study where they had a system that only had cereal grains and alfalfa rotated with grain. Alfalfa rotated with grain with a one-time manure application and then a prairie system essentially as a control. What you can see is that the prairie system had the highest amount of Olson phosphorus, followed by the grain only system. And then this alfalfa grain system actually had less than the grain uh, because alfalfa is such a big user of phosphorus. And the alfalfa grain had quite low levels of Olson phosphorus. When they also measured total phosphorus, those trends seem to stay kind of similar, where you know, the prairie system as the control had the most amount of phosphorus, the grain only system, the next most, alfalfa grain with manure, the next most, and then the alfalfa uh, grain rotation had the least. So the, the point here is that not only are we using up available phosphorus in these um, high phosphorus use systems, we're also um, using up total phosphorus. And this shows the total phosphorus removed by 12 years of harvest, quite a bit, especially in this alfalfa grain system, 240 pounds per acre of phosphorus. Uh, Jeff asks, why does a prairie maintain its phosphorus? Um, you know, and what I don't have here is the pre-level. This is after uh, 12 years, but I'm assuming it's simply because no phosphorus is getting removed in the, the form of harvest. Thanks, Doug. So if you can, if you have, you know, the ability to uh, use kind of a maintenance approach, replacing the phosphorus that's being removed, you're going to need to know, well, how much phosphorus is being removed by harvest. And so this is a crop that shows the uptake 
in pounds of P2O5 per bushel for some somewhat cro common crops grown in Montana. Spring wheat, barley, and oat is going to remove somewhere between about 0.3 and 0.7 pounds of phosphorus per, per bushel. That's uptake. And then uh, you know, a fairly high amount of that gets removed by the grain itself. Flax and canola actually have somewhat higher uptake and higher removal. And then fava bean is the winner. It takes up a, a very high amount of phosphorus uh, per bushel, as do lentil and pea. So again, maybe some, some goals for how much phosphorus might you add to maintain your phosphorus. Where is phosphorus most available? It's most available somewhere around pH uh, 6.5. And it's more available in low calcium soils, which we don't have many of in Montana. Um, it, it does seem to increase when we have higher soil organic matter. Some people have found that composting rock phosphate or bone meal with some uh, manure can actually increase the availability, probably because of those microbes um, doing their job. And then if you are purchasing something like rock phosphate, you wanna find something with a fine particle size, which is going to be more available than if it has a coarse uh, particle size. And getting that product, say bone meal, compost, uh, whatever it is into the soil is going to increase its availability. Rock phosphate has up to about 27% uh, P2O5. It's not all that, that high. Um, it again can be fairly unavailable. It takes time uh, to become available. There's also, of course, issues with mining, transportation costs, and unfortunately, heavy metals. Bone meal has somewhat higher availability. It's generally somewhere around 310 to up to maybe 318 zero, a little bit of nitrogen and more uh, phosphorus. It's a little more soluble than rock phosphate. Again, some work I did over 10 years ago, sorry, Jeff, um, in some of Perry's plot studies with bone meal. I did find a pretty nice response about a four bushel per acre higher uh, yield with bone meal than without with winter wheat. And then the next year on lentil, I saw uh, no advantage. So hard to know why we didn't continue to see a benefit. Maybe lentil wasn't limited by low phosphorus and winter wheat was, or maybe the winter wheat used that little bit of extra nitrogen that came with a bone meal, which of course would not have benefited uh, the subsequent lentil crop. Looking at, again, some work done in Big Sandy on, on Bob's place, we did a study where we added different amounts of phosphorus as rock phosphate and grew those or added that rock phosphate to different cover crops, buckwheat, mustard, spring pea, and then fallow as a control. And we grew winter wheat uh, the next year to see if we could see any benefits of either the rock phosphate or the previous cover crop, because some of these cover crops have been documented to increase phosphorus availability. Although it looks like there's some differences here, the, the variability was high enough that we actually did not see any uh, significant differences, but it does, you know, look overall that maybe um, mustard did fairly well at um, helping winter wheat grow the subsequent year with maybe spring pea uh, just somewhat uh, worse than mustard. So some crops are better at extracting phosphorus, but that doesn't always necessarily benefit the next rotation, I think is what we learned from this study. Yields did increase with phosphorus rate, but not there were no differences among those different cover species. What about some other options for increasing phosphorus availability? Um, AMF, our muscular mycorrhizal fungi, can reach places that roots can't. They can help mobilize phosphorus. 
certain crops like cereals, legumes, and sunflowers are good mycorrhizal hosts. Brassicas are, are not. Um, there is some greater potential to have benefit in lower phosphorus soils from AMF than in higher pea soils. Less tillage should help uh, promote these fungi, as will perennial crops. There's also been some work done on bacteria that can mobilize rock phosphate or naturally um, calcium phosphate minerals that are in all of your soils. Again, greater potential in low phosphorus soils. I would say before you spend money on, on these types of amendments though, do test strips, you know, before you spend a fair amount of money on whole farm or whole field. So just to sum up, uh, nitrogen can be supplied with livestock manure and legume cover crops. As Doug pointed out, you know, manure is, is relatively low in, in nitrogen. So adding manure for phosphorus and legumes for nitrogen is probably the way to go. Probably not going to build soil nitrogen if you don't have, um, you know, a fair amount of legume in rotation, either as a, a grain crop or as a cover crop. Phosphorus can be supplied with either manure or certified products, um, but phosphorus availability is often low, especially in the rock phosphate products. At least based on our one study, uh, cover crops do not appear to affect phosphorus availability for subsequent crop, but that was one site one year, so there might be a uh, potential there. Seen mixed results with amendments such as these bacteria that can mobilize uh, phosphorus. We need more work done in Montana for sure. And sulfur can be supplied with manure or certified products, but we don't have a good handle on the economics of sulfur in organic systems. And finally, proper timing and placement of any materials are really going to help increase the use efficiency of those products. Uh, for those of you who are CCAs, go ahead and scan uh, this QR code 